Now we are ready to begin the discussions on mechanism design, which is the uh, the inverse thing of game theory that we have discussed so far. And uh, to motivate this uh, mechanism design problem, let me start with a story. I am sure that you have heard this story in some form or the other in the past. So this is a story about one king and two women, who both of whom are claiming to be the mother of a child. And they come to the king's court and uh, says that they want this child and uh, ask the king to decide uh, who will be who is the rightful mother of uh, of the uh, of that child. And you know the the rest of the story. The king uh, says that uh, let's cut this uh, baby into two and uh, give it to each of these uh, women. And uh, listening to this. One of the women says that I, I give up my uh, uh, my claim and then the uh, king comes to know that this is the, the right mother and gives the, uh, gives the child to, uh, to her. Now presumably this is a nice mechanism and uh, you might be uh, wondering that uh, this is a brilliant uh, way of deciding who is the right mother. But if you think carefully about it, uh, you can see some of the flaws of this mechanism. So what happens if you try this mechanism once more? Will that work? So for instance, tomorrow if uh, uh, another similar dispute happens and the king tries to do the same thing and both the women give up their, uh, their uh, claim to the child, uh, then the mechanism cannot decide which, which of these women to give the uh, child to. So the problem with uh, this mechanism, this particular mechanism, is that it is not committing to its uh, its rules. So initially the rule was to cut the baby and then give it to each of these uh, women. And then uh, later, uh, based on the reaction of these uh, women, it is changing its rules. So that is not the kind of mechanisms that we will be discussing in this, uh, in this course. Uh, we will be uh, interested in mechanisms which are committed to its rules. So no matter whatever happens, you can repeat it multiple times without uh, without losing any of its properties. So think of a different mechanism. So if the king asked for to both these mothers to uh, keep some amount of uh, wealth, whatever wealth uh, they feel uh, this uh, child is worth to them, they can, they can bid for that and then decide in favor of the woman who bids highest and then ask her to pay uh, the second highest bid, that is the, the losing bid. So presumably the real mother must have much higher value for that kid and it would have uh, bid uh, all its wealth, whatever it uh, she has uh, for that baby and then uh, the other person will have much lower value and uh, uh, at the end she gets that baby maybe at a much lower cost. And uh, if you think about this mechanism, every time you run this mechanism this will work. In the later part of this course we will certainly discuss about this mechanism, uh, although not in this context, but in a different context. So the, the, the uh, whole point of telling this story is that there are certain mechanisms which are not committing to its rules and there are certain mechanisms uh, which commits to its rule, rules and therefore it, uh, it can be uh, applied every time. And that is the kind of mechanism that we are going to discuss in this course. To summarize uh, the idea of mechanism design, the objectives or the desired outcomes are already set and the task is to set the rules of the game. Uh, as in this example, uh, there are many other examples. So, for instance, election or uh, uh, deciding the winner of an election, that is one uh, desired outcome. Of course, uh, we need to uh, decide the winner of the election based on certain, certain uh, objectives and we can set the rules how, how we can get those objectives. Or we can uh, do certain kind of a resource allocation. So let's say scarce resource, something like spectrum or cloud resources, um, that can be licensed or given away uh, with respect to uh, certain desirable properties. Similarly, matching students to universities. This is, a, uh, this is also a mechanism design problem. 
So let us formally present the uh, general model of uh, mechanism design. Uh, as before, we have a set of players with the uh, with the set X we denote uh, the set of outcomes. So, for instance, in this previous example, the winner in an election is a is one of the outcomes. So, the the possible set of uh, candidates in that election is uh, this set of possible outcomes. Similarly, which resource should be allocated to whom? So, all possible allocations are a feasible set of outcomes in this mechanism design problem. Now, we are also interested in uh, defining another set which is called the theta of i, capital theta of i. This is uh, known as the set of private information of that agent i. And we, we uh, sort of uh, seen this kind of a situation in the case of Bayesian games. We have also defined uh, the type set and this, is, uh, this uh, actually uh, uses the same name. So, this set is called the type set. Uh, and a specific uh, type of uh, player i is denoted by lowercase theta of i which belongs to this set of capital theta i. So the meaning of type is that it, it can actually uh, manifest the preferences of, uh, of different outcomes in different ways. So uh, uh, let us look at two different uh, paradigms on which this kind of a type is defined. So the first, uh, uh, first uh, kind of manifestation is ordinal manifestation which means that we can only uh, talk about the ordering over these uh, outcomes. So the, uh, the most uh, simple example will be uh, in the context of uh, election or voting. Uh, every individual agent, every voter has a complete ordering or, or partial ordering over the candidates in, uh, that are contesting in this election. So let's say someone prefers A over B over C, that could be one way so this particular ordering might be one theta of i. So that that is an ordinal ordering. Uh, notice that we are not really saying anything about how much uh, you prefer. So in this case, we only know that A is more preferred than B and B is more preferred than C. But nothing is said uh, about how much they are preferred. When we actually say how much that is preferred, that brings us to the cardinal setup. So where, what do we do in that case? We actually define something like a utility function, which takes that outcome, so uh, one element from that set X, let's say one candidate, and based on what type you have, uh, it is assigning a real number to that particular uh, outcome. So you can say that, well, I, I have A, but I, I can also give certain numbers to it, let's say 10 versus for B, I can give some number like 8 and for C, maybe a very small number like 1. Uh, so these numbers will now represent my utility uh, when each of these uh, outcomes are chosen. So that is that is a cardinal. So now uh, not only you know uh, that uh, A is more preferred and B is more preferred than C, you also know with what intensity you prefer. So this uh, kind of a model, so where your utility, so utility is just a real number uh, which maps this uh, uh, this x and this theta i into r. This kind of a, uh, a mapping where it is only dependent on your own type, agent i's own type, this is called the private value model. We'll come back to this point, why it is private value, for the very reason that it is dependent only on your type. But it might be a, a little more general, a general case where the utility is not only dependent on your type, but it, it can be dependent on the type of all the players. And in that situation, we call that, uh, that kind of a utility model as the interdependent value model or interdependent utility model. So we'll, uh, uh, for the most part of this course, we'll be only interested in this independent, uh, independent private value model, independent in the sense that it is only depending on its own type. Okay, so let's uh, discuss about certain examples to understand this notation better, uh, as we have already mentioned uh, briefly. So in the context of voting or election, X is the set of all candidates. Now theta i is a ranking over all these candidates. So uh, as we said, I mean, A over B over C means that and that is theta i. So uh, that is for the ordinal preferences. 
Now, if you look at the single object allocation, and we have also discussed this uh, in the past, uh, an outcome, let's say um, we, uh, we first decide who is going to win that object. Uh, so there is one uh, indivisible object which is to be allocated and it has to be allocated at a certain price so um, when people are so uh, this is the uh, auction setup where you are actually giving away that object to one of these individuals and you are also charging a payment so in that case this uh, vector so the outcome will be this uh, vector a uh, and payment vector uh, the tuple of these two things and this is essentially the set of x in this case so what is this a vector? So you can imagine that the, it has n components, uh, e, uh, one for each agent. And these uh, components can take only values 0 or 1. And of course, uh, when you, whenever you are taking the sum over all these uh, AIs, so all these uh, components, that can at most be 1. That means at most one uh, uh, individual can be given this object. This is uh, upper bounded by one. That means it, the object might not be allocated as well. So uh, all AIs could be equal to zero. So we'll be uh, calling the, the vector A as allocation vector. Similarly, there is a payment vector, which is a very similar thing. It has also n components, but PI, so uh, the uh, the ith component PI is, a, is the payment charge to I. Now, if you look at theta i, theta i is something like whenever this uh, item goes to agent i, how much it values. So there is certain amount of monetary value associated when uh, this uh, object goes to that uh, individual i. So that theta i is actually uh, denoting that, uh, that uh, value. So therefore, we can actually uh, think about uh, the utility of player i in the following way. So notice that this x is nothing but this tuple of two things. So we have already defined x here. So it is just looking at when we are defining the utility of player i, it is just looking at the ith component of that a vector and also the ith component of the payment vector. And multiplying this, notice that this ai can be either 0 or 1, multiplying that with theta i. So that means if that uh, agent wins, then it gets, uh, gets a value of theta i and it makes a payment of pi. So in this case, we are keeping it general. That is, the payment uh, payment will be the same irrespective of the winning. But uh, in in an actual mechanism, this pi can actually be dependent on this ai, whether it wins or not. So it may charge only when the object uh, when the uh, agent wins that object. Otherwise, it the payment is zero. So these are two examples, one for the uh, ordinal uh, preference and one for the cardinal preference. So this is the example of the type set, so type of agent. Now that is the, uh, the description of the uh, mechanism from the agent's point of view. Now the, uh, as we have said that mecha in mechanism design, the mechanism designer or the planner also has an objective. Uh, without objective, we, we, we don't define a mechanism. So how can we actually uh, mathematically capture that objective? And this is essentially captured through the social choice function or SCF for short. So what does it mean? That if the agents had these types theta one, theta two and so on, then what outcome we should have taken? So therefore this social choice function is nothing but a mapping from this uh, Cartesian products of all capital theta i's so when each of these players have actually um, uh, choosing their own theta i's, so their own types, then in that uh, in that uh, state of this game or uh, in that state of that world, the social choice function should pick one specific outcome. So what is an example? So let's say in voting, uh, when you are talking about elections, so each of these theta i's are nothing but different preferences. So theta i's are uh, those examples let's say b a c uh, for for player i and similar similarly could be different um, uh, preference orders for different players we want a certain desirable thing to happen when we are selecting the winner so for instance that uh, desirable property could be that if there exists a candidate who beats everyone else in pairwise uh, contests 
So let's say we are looking about only B and C and we are looking at how many people have actually voted B over C and how many people have actually voted C over B. If B over C, this number of uh, people who have voted B over C is larger than those who have voted C over B, then we will call that this B is beating C in pairwise election. If there exists an, a candidate which does this for every uh, other, other candidate, then we, we should definitely out, output that as a winner. So that could be one desirable outcome. So we can actually put certain restrictions or constraints on the social choice function. So this could be a good uh, social choice function. Similarly, you can think of a different thing that uh, if this was, so suppose B over A over C, uh, or maybe uh, just the, the topmost candidate, so B, uh, B was the topmost candidate. I don't really care about the uh, the or ordering over the uh, over the rest of the candidates for uh, uh, all these uh, voters. Uh, but the topmost one is always going to be B. Then the social choice uh, function should output B because that is most pre uh, preferred, unanimously preferred by all the agents. So therefore, that should be an outcome. So that could also be a desirable property. So you can define different kinds of uh, desirable properties and that is what social choice function is. So similarly, this is uh, the uh, example from the ordinal world, but in the cardinal world, you can think of a public project choice. So suppose we are uh, choosing one of these uh, projects and where this theta is just giving you some real number. So theta i is nothing but uh, whichever public project you choose, so uh, this X could be set of all public projects, building a bridge, uh, building a public park or museum, whatever. So that uh, gives you a certain amount of happiness or satisfaction whenever you, uh, uh, if you are th uh, agent I. So that is uh, captured by this uh, function uh, theta I, which is nothing but its type. So theta i a is nothing but the value of agent i for that uh, uh, public project a. Now what you are doing uh, as, a, as the mechanism designer or the social choice function, the desirable property is that you will take the sum of all the agents uh, uh, valuations and you will pick that uh, public project which maximizes this sum. Quite, quite fair. I mean you look at all the agents and uh, if you are building a museum then you look at how much satisfaction it gives to the all the players the sum of that uh, or if you are building a uh, public park or a bridge depending on that we, you will pick that one which maximizes the sum of the values now it, here is the most vital question that all these types are essentially private information of all these agents so we definitely have to ensure that we can we need to create a game such that this f theta the desirable uh, objective emerges as an outcome of an equilibrium we have already defined different kinds of equilibrium and we'll reiterate some of those in this uh, context uh, so, but we definitely need to design a game where this f theta this uh, socially desirable outcome should emerge as an outcome and for, for doing that in an equilibrium, we need these mechanisms. And that is exactly what we are going to discuss. So uh, let me formally define it, uh, formally define what is known as an indirect mechanism. We'll also come back to the direct mechanism uh, very soon. So an indirect mechanism is a collection of message spaces and a decision. So the message space of player I is given by MI, so M1 to MN uh, for each of these n players are the message spaces. You, uh, you can imagine, I can, I can give a, a kind of an analogous uh, example. So imagine that, um, that there are in the, in the railway reservation system, uh, there are different classes and there are different prices for each of these classes. Now, um, I don't know uh, what are the types of these agents are. So maybe the agents value, so they have a value for uh, the class that they are traveling and they also have a budget constraint. Uh, beyond a certain point, they cannot really purchase those tickets. Based on that, they are choosing one of these classes. So the choice of the classes are, uh, are the message space. So they can only indicate that which, uh, which class they want to choose and that is constituting the message space. And this is a kind of a derived information 
from their own type. So you are not really asking uh, how much they value each of these uh, classes or um, uh, what is their comfort level that they are looking for and what are their uh, budgets uh, to travel in this train. Uh, you are just asking them to purchase a ticket from the available set of classes. So this is, uh, this is one analogous example of how you can think about this message spaces. So it's not exactly the same as their types. So types could be those basic information that I, that I have discussed. Uh, don't connect it with uh, anything beyond that. Maybe the railways is not running a mechanism. Uh, but uh, I'm trying to give that example just to give you a flavor of what a message space uh, should, uh, should mean and how you can think about it. Now, once uh, each of these agents have actually chosen their message, uh, so in this case, each of these agents are picking something from this message space. So they have already picked uh, their, uh, their choices of uh, the uh, classes of travel. And then there is a decision rule uh, named G, which will take all these uh, messages together and pop out one of the outcomes. And this will be the same outcome space as we have defined before. That is the, um, maybe it, it, the decision could be like how many classes, so how many coaches of a specific uh, class should be added and so on. Now, uh, that is an indirect mechanism. Uh, it is indirect because you are not directly dealing with the, their types, rather you are dealing with their message spaces. A direct mechanism will be the same as above where this message space is directly their type set. So instead of asking them for their messages, you are just asking them their, for their types. And also the, the decision rule is nothing but the social choice function itself. So whatever you are uh, trying, to, uh, uh, trying to achieve using this mechanism, you are just giving that as the decision rule. So, so in that case, all these M MIs will be replaced by theta i's and the g will be replaced by f and that will be the direct mechanism. So here is a schematic diagram. So g is the rule that uh, you have you have chosen and all of this m1 to mn. So m1 is belonging to capital M1. So each of these players have been given this uh, message spaces and they are picking some messages. And once everyone has picked their messages, g operates on them and then gives out a specific outcome which lives in that space capital X. So this uh, particular kind of a indirect mechanism uh, is not very commonplace. We don't really deal with uh, this kind of mechanisms, this kind of indirect mechanisms that much. Uh, it is because a result that will show very soon uh, known as the revelation principle which actually says that you don't really need to look at the indirect mechanisms if there exists an indirect mechanism then we'll always have a direct mechanism but we, uh, uh, please wait for that we'll come back to that uh, result very soon now we have already defined the uh, weekly dominant strategies in the game theory part of this course so in this context let us just define it as we use it for the for the mechanism design and we will definitely see that there is a certain change very uh, minor but uh, there is a, a slight change in the definition of this weak dominance so uh, in this mechanism we say that a, a message mi is weakly dominant for player i at theta i if you look at this uh, uh, look at this thing so you know that uh, the utilities are defined over outcome and its own type. So we have, we remember that UI is nothing but the uh, the mapping from X cross capital theta I. This is for uh, independent private value valuation to R. So therefore, this X outcome we are going to choose, and we are going to choose based on what uh, these agents have chosen as their messages. So suppose agent I has chosen its message MI and other players have chosen some M minus I tilde, something. And uh, we said that this M MI is weakly dominant if it uh, dominates for any other message of the same player. So if the player instead chooses MI prime, uh, then uh, this utility will never be larger than the utility that it gets when it, uh, when it picks the message MI under this uh, type theta r and this should happen for all m minus i tildes so no matter whatever the other 
no matter what messages the other players are choosing uh, this inequality will get satisfied and it should also get satisfied for all mi prime now what is the difference between the weekly dominant strategy that we have defined uh, in the weekly dominant strategy we have also defined something like uh, a strict dominance uh, strict inequality to be satisfied for some uh, m minus i tilde that is not no longer true in this uh, definition uh, the the purpose so we have actually weakened that uh, that definition that was a more strict definition uh, the reason being that uh, in this kind of a situation the the space of mechanisms that we can set, uh, we can find is a little larger and also whenever we are talking about optimization it is much difficult to handle uh, strict inequalities so if we are trying to design a mechanism and write all these constraints this uh, weakly dominant constraints as uh, as the um, as the constraint set then we will not be able to solve those kind of uh, uh, optimization problems and that is one of the major reasons why we actually migrate to this weaker definition of uh, weakly dominant strategy in this uh, in this uh, module and uh, also in the later part of uh, this course we will de uh, define certain things based on the cardinal preferences so here you have already seen that we i have used this uh, utility uh, definition which is a cardinal utility definition but you can also cast the same uh, definition uh, uh, for ordinal preferences so the above inequality so here remember that this is a uh, this is an outcome how you can write that this outcome is more preferred than this outcome under a specific type theta i is by writing this. So if you are choosing mi, then the outcome that you are getting is more preferred than uh, uh, the outcome if you are choosing mi prime as your message. And then also we will be calling that as weakly dominant. Now that we have defined this weak dominance. Uh, it is the right time to say what how we are going to implement a social choice function so we are going to use this term implementation so we are going to say that a social choice function f is implemented in dominant strategies of course in weakly dominant strategies by this message uh, by this mechanism indirect mechanism m1 to mn comma g if two things happen so there exist some message mappings. You can think of this SIs as strategies that if you have a specific type, then you choose a specific uh, message. So for instance, if your uh, price to performance or uh, comfort uh, to budget ratio has a specific form, then that is your type. Uh, then you choose uh, to uh, purchase ticket of a specific class and if that is your strategy so there exists such kind of strategies such that this si theta i is a dominant strategy for agent i at that theta i and this should hold for all theta i in capital theta and for, for all players so it, you can you can actually expand out all this uh, uh, what do we mean by this dominant strategy si theta i is essentially a dominant strategy for that player i so what it what it means is that uh, this weekly dominant strategy, as we have said, that it's a most predictable outcome. So you will be you are expected to choose those SI theta i's in an equilibrium in a weekly dominant strategy equilibrium. And uh, the second condition says that in that dominant strategy equilibrium, weekly dominant strategy equilibrium, you actually implement the objective that you wanted to satisfy. So if the type profile was theta, and each of these agents had chosen s1 theta 1 s2 theta 2 up to sn theta n then this uh, rule g uh, would, would have mapped that uh, to be exactly equal to the f of theta so in the equilibrium you are actually implementing the social choice function and that is exactly what it means so you are uh, implementing so the first condition is just telling you that there exists such kind of strategies which is a weekly dominant strategy equilibrium and in that weekly dominant strategy equilibrium you satisfy whatever you wanted to satisfy and that is exactly the meaning of implementation now we are going to call this an indirect implementation because we are using an indirect mechanism uh, as we have defined here we are going to call that the social choice function f is a dominant strat is dominant strategy implementable by this indirect mechanism m1 to mn comma g now you can also uh, talk about the direct mechanism so 
we know that in the direct mechanism the message space itself is theta i and the uh, decision rule is the social choice function itself uh, this uh, particular implementation has a very specific name it's called the dominant strategy incentive compatible if this inequality holds that whenever you are uh, reporting or you are picking that message which is exactly equal to your type when you whenever you are uh, uh, revealing that type in a truthful way then the utility that you are going to get is at least as much as the utility uh, by misreporting your type so that is exactly what we this uh, terms we will be using very often uh, you can see already that uh, we are sort of uh, uh, going towards truthfulness so the truthfulness itself is saying that uh, if you have a type uh, theta i uh, so this second term in this tuple is essentially the true type so if your true type is theta i and you are revealing uh, your type to be theta i then you get the utility which will not be uh, surpassed by any other utility when you are uh, when your true type is theta i and you are reporting something like theta i prime and if this inequality holds for all theta i theta i prime and theta minus i tilde so that is why it is dominant strategy because other players might not be truthful as well but uh, 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 as an agent i your best response will be to report theta i truthfully and if it holds for all agents then we are going to call that this direct mechanism is essentially a dominant strategy incentive compatible so to find if that social choice function is dominant strategy implementable we essentially need to search over all possible indirect mechanisms um, so that is that is one uh, difficult part that if we if we go for the indirect implementation then this uh, this spaces could be very arbitrary and large we don't do not really know whether there exist any mechanism so if we could not find any uh, indirect mechanism does not mean that it is not dominant strategy implementable but luckily we have a result as we said uh, uh, the revelation principle which reduces this search space which says that uh, if you have a dominant strategy implementable mechanism then you will always have a dominant strategy incentive compatible mechanism which we are going to discuss in the next module